Bellis and I'm a PhD student at the University of Leicester and I'm in my first year. Today I'm going to be talking about the relevance of socio-zooarchaeology to the rest of zooarchaeology, not zooarchaeology, archaeology I should say, and how we can perhaps bring these two areas a bit closer together. So I would say the last 15 years in zooarchaeology have been quite good for the discipline. We've had some big developments in theory and we've also had the development of animal paleopathology. Before this, animal paleopathology would be much more of an interesting specimens approach where you would note perhaps one or two pathological specimens in assemblage. Now we're moving more towards a systematic analysis. We also see increasing interest in interdisciplinary engagement, such as the presentation before me, and also Mark Maltby's Integrating Zooarchaeology in 2006. This is a key volume because it looks at how zooarchaeology is integrated with lots of different areas, such as architecture analysis, material culture analysis, historical analysis and ethnography. However, despite this, I still notice some different distance between zooarchaeology and the rest of archaeology. I don't see zooarchaeology mentioned much in wider thematic works beyond perhaps diet and maybe a bit of ritual, although this is arguably less than before and has been improving. So a new direction that I would say has come up in about the last five years is social zooarchaeology. The term is first used in Marciniak's Placing Animals in the Neolithic, the social zooarchaeology of prehistoric farming communities, but it's not really widely used until Ru Nerissa Russell's volume Social Zooarchaeology from 2011 onwards. And the whole point of zooarchaeology is to explore the human-animal relationship fully, not just in terms of food or economic value, which is what traditional zooarchaeology tends to excel at much more. Another part of this, which Naomi Sykes talks about in her work Beastly Questions, is that looking at the human-animal relations during the life of the animal <coughs> is important as well. Because a lot of work up until fairly recently tends to look more often at the animal in death rather than life, which is obviously much easier to do, but now with these developments in theory and animal play pathology, we can start tackling this a lot more. So one of the key animals, I would say, in the study of social zooarchaeology is dogs, as man's best friend. They've been working together for about 15,000 years, give or take a bit, and there's a lot of do dog remains in archaeological record. Perhaps not as many as cattle, sheep or pigs, the, the traditional triad. But the great thing about dogs is that we find a lot of whole burials too. And the nice thing also is that they're robust enough to be found in the archaeological record re relative to perhaps birds or fish, but they're not so large that they're rarely found whole, such as cattle or horses. And this relative size makes it much easier to gather large numbers of them to work within the lab. And now in the Roman period, dogs are particularly important. They're a key part of Roman society. A wolf was part of their founding myth, the myth of Romulus and Remus. And dog depictions are found everywhere in Roman society. For instance, poetry, agricultural texts, murals, sculpture, jewellery, grave depictions. And at least, that should actually say 50, I, um, uh, not 50, um, it should actually say 100 texts, so I revised that but at least a hundred texts in the Roman world discuss dogs in some way, shape or form. A good example of this is Colin Miller's agricultural text where he discusses different dog types and he goes into such detail that he even talks about the importance of having a white sheep dog so as not to mistake it for a wolf in the early light of the day. And Roman trade and imperialism is also linked with the presence of smaller dogs in the archaeological record, particularly in Roman Britain. So with all this in mind, I decided to do my MA work on the welfare and social relations of Roman and British dogs. And I'm going to talk a bit about some of the most interesting conclusions I got from this. Now the first one is that my thesis noticed a statistically significant difference in welfare between dogs on urban and rural sites. Now this could indicate some kind of different relations between dogs on urban and rural sites. But there's an in other interesting possibility. These differences in welfare was primarily due to a high rate of femur, which is to say the upper leg, fractures. In the modern virtual literature, I found that this is an injury that tends to be much more associated with accidents. And this could then be used to talk about the wider urban environment. A lot of urban reconstructions 
look at the city often in a kind of pristine sort of state. I don't tend to talk about buildings in construction, in decay or disrepair. And this could potentially indicate that the urban environment was more hazardous than what we might otherwise have considered. Another key area that my MA thesis found was that the bone evidence shows low levels of intentional cruelty based on the markers we will tend to look for that may indicate abuse. I would say of about 68 deposits of dogs, of individual dogs, perhaps about two, there was a possibility that abuse was going on. And this is really significant because psychological studies in the present day suggest a link between animal directed abuse and abuse directed at humans. And here I don't necessarily say that we should just completely project this onto the past and critically, but something that's really worth thinking about when we consider what the welfare of humans and how humans treat each other, how are they also treating their animals? There is also the likelihood that many of the dogs that I, um, that I looked at the secondary reports for were living in significant amounts of pain, perhaps one in seven in total, from things such as infect severe infection, osteoarthritis and poorly healed fractures. And I think this can contribute to knowledge outside of zooarchaeology in several areas, such as Roman veterinary knowledge, and also considering the ownership of animals, if we find serious differences in the care between different animals, that one was very extensively cared for throughout severe osteoarthritis, where the others have been left to have injuries and fractures that have healed appallingly. I can't really say too much in terms of my PhD at the moment because I'm only about three months in. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the directions and how, again, this can be quite useful. So what I want to do is explore the city-country difference further. And I also want to look at military sites as well. And also look at the differences in animal relations between different social groups across time and across different regions as well. And this is important when considering wider Roman archaeology. David Mattingly's work looks at, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, Rome, an imperial possession. But he notices in material culture patterns between urban, rural and military sites in terms of um, how they express their identity, their lit rates of literacy and the different types of um, religious expression they had. And given that we find that in the Roman period that smaller dogs tend to be introduced to Roman Britain. I'm wondering if this may have also been expressed in the archaeological record and the way people kept dogs and interacted with them, that different social groups regarded their dogs differently. So social archaeology has th things to offer archaeology, new, new and interesting things. Why is it not better integrated? And I notice zoo archaeologists tend to sometimes be somewhat separate from the rest of archaeology in terms of publication and collaboration, and even in within, sometimes in academic departments. And sometimes tend to be a bit of a, more of a jack of all trades in terms of areas and time periods. I also notice zoo archaeology, that again. Zoo archaeology is less integrated with ancient history and classics than other areas of archaeology. Obviously there are many classicists and ancient historians that are unwilling to work with archaeology whatsoever. But I notice those that are more interested in the area are quite comfortable working with material culture and landscape but tend to shy away from environmental archaeology and I'll say The Cattle of the Sun is one of the few books that is willing to look at the animals more. I wonder if this is partly due to the um, technical nature of archaeology. Some zooarchaeologists tend to have a bit more in common with biologists. Zooarchaeologists who develop new techniques and work much more heavily with statistics. And this is definitely no bad thing because we do need people to develop techniques that can increase the scope of our ideas. But even for less technical zooarchaeologists who want to work perhaps with, within an area or the disciplines more. All the time spent in the laboratory does make it harder to acquire that period-based knowledge that perhaps other archaeologists may gain a bit more readily. So how do we reach other archaeologists? I sometimes wonder if the archaeologists should be a jack of all trades or if maybe we need a few more period specialists. And I understand that there are practical problems with just suggesting this 
given that it's a heck of a lot easier to find a job if you can work in different areas. But I see the work of archaeologists such as um, Michael McKinnon, who tends to focus a bit more on the classical period, and I think the idea of specialism really could have some merit. I also consider if we need to maybe collaborate more with non-zooarchaeologists. I see quite a bit of collaboration with zooarchaeologists, but what I really, really think needs to be done is more with perhaps classical archaeologists in the case of the Roman world and just other specialists from other areas. I also know that in a lot of um, university courses, in some of my modules, I tended to do a lot of stuff on um, material culture, you know, small workshops, but I noticed the same doesn't really happen for zooarchaeology. Obviously it takes a lot of time to get familiar with techniques and such, but I sometimes wonder if perhaps doing some small workshops to get people more comfortable with zooarchaeological data and be able to use it or at least just interpret and read it might help us in the long run. So ultimately, returning to my title, who cares about bones? I think using social zooarchaeology to offer and suggest answers to research questions beyond subsistence that other archaeologists care about is key. But I think ultimately we're not going to get everybody care about the specifics of bones most people are just not going to care about mortality patterns. But I think ultimately, using socials or archaeology, we can make them care about our conclusions. My final acknowledgements are the Midlands Three Cities Doctoral Training Partnership, who are funding my PhD research, the University of Leicester, where I'm currently undertaking my research, session organisers, and also additional thanks to my supervisors, Naomi Sykes and Richard Thomas, and also to my partner, Richard Evans. And thank you all for listening. Thank you.